Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number 10 in this Bible study series that we're calling Unlocking the Old Testament. We're taking familiar stories from the Old Testament and looking at them through a new lens, through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ and uncovering deeper meanings in those stories as a result of that. You are gonna need your Bible or your Bible app open today to 2 Samuel chapter 18. We're gonna be looking at verses six through 17, uh, the story of Absalom today. And uh, you, there's also a listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Just scroll down, click on that link. It's a PDF. You can download it to your computer and print it out. There are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson. And then there are some discussion questions there for you and your small group or you and your family to go through together afterwards. Before we jump into the lesson today, though, let's pray together, shall we? Father, these stories are ones that, that we know, or at least parts of them, uh, and yet they take on a different meaning when we look at them through the lens of the gospel, through the lens of Jesus and his ministry. And that's what we want. That's what we're, we're looking for. Father, we, we want to we wanna find the deeper meanings of these stories, and we want to apply them to our lives so that we come out different. And so, Father, that becomes our prayer, is that you'll do just that through the work of your Spirit in us, through the power of your Word, you'll change us. That as we open your Word, you will open our hearts. And you'll cause us to see ourselves differently. You'll cause us to see the truth about who you are. You'll cause us to see the people around us differently. That you'll change us, that you will more and more transform us into the people that you've called us to become. We truly love you, Lord, and we love your word, and we love its place in our lives, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're asking the same couple of questions every week when we look at these stories. We're asking, number one, why is this story in the Bible? Why did God want us to know this story? And number two, uh, what do we learn about this story uh, when we look at it through the lens of Jesus, through the lens of the gospel message? Uh, what are the deeper meanings of this story looked at uh, from that perspective? Over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at David, and this will be our third week, in a sense, looking at King David. Two weeks ago, we looked at the anointing of the child David who would one day become king, and we learned from that lesson that that man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And that was such an important takeaway from that lesson. Last week then, we looked at the very familiar story of David and Goliath uh, and learned how we fight matters uh, to God. And uh, we learned some things about David in that, in that story as well. Still with this th same theme, now we are finding David uh, after he has been the king for some time. Uh, we're going to be looking in 2 Samuel chapter 18. Uh, this is part of the darkest season of David's life. This was after his, uh, after his sin with Bathsheba, and he's living through the consequences of that sin. There is division within his family, just as God told him would come as a result of that sin. Uh, we're also seeing uh, the end of the story of his son Absalom. Uh, that story actually unfolds over the course of five or six chapters in 2 Samuel. Chapters 13 through this chapter uh, tell that story of Absalom, one of his sons. Uh, as great as David was as a king, uh, we see through these chapters that he was pretty terribly flawed as a father and as a husband, as a family man. Uh, he had multiple wives, which was not all that unusual for monarchs of that time, but with those wives, he had multiple sons, any one of whom might be prepared to inherit the throne. Uh, and, those, and there were six sons, specifically, who were born of six different wives while David was in the first seven years of his reign. That would have been in Hebron. Uh, Absalom would, would, have, would have been one of those six sons born of those six different wives. There were 13 more sons born of still other wives once J David moved to Jerusalem for the last 30 years of his reign. And that's not to mention all of the unnamed sons, children, born of his various concubines. And so uh, his family was large, 
but it was also a mess as the story from today uh, shows us. Absalom was his third son, the son born of Makkah, who was the daughter of a foreign king, the daughter of the king of Geshur. Absalom, uh, over the course of time, uh, ended up killing David's firstborn son, his own uh, stepbrother, uh, Amnon, because Amnon had raped Absalom's sister. Absalom then fled for three years back to his grandfather's home in Geshur, where his grandfather was the king. David then permitted Absalom to return to, his, to Jerusalem, but he forbade him to come into the king's presence for another two years. So David was kind of giving him the cold shoulder, the silent treatment. He refused to see him, refused to uh, interact with him at all. And this, this is what actually broke the relationship between them. Uh, this is where it could have been healed had David been the kind of loving father who forgives and receives his son back, but he was not that with Absalom. Uh, over time, uh, Absalom, uh, in his bitterness, began to woo the hearts of the rest of Israel and actually led a rebellion against his father, David. Uh, David ended up in order not to have to fight against his son, he ended up moving most of his court and family and fled Jerusalem altogether and went out into the wilderness to avoid the bloody battle that necessarily would have ensued as Absalom was coming in to take over the, take over the, the capital city. David is therefore exiled along with his, his army, his fighting men, and his family, and he has now prepared a military strategy for regaining the throne. After he's gone and, and been out in the wilderness, he's strategizing for how to retake the throne from Absalom. It's going to mean a war with Israel. Now, in this chapter, in this uh, passage we're looking at, Israel actually describes uh, Absalom's side of this. David is no longer fighting for Israel, so to speak. Uh, the passage refers to David's army as literally David's army or David's fighting men. Uh, so there is going to be a, a battle. There's going to be a war with Israel, and Israel is now being led by his son Absalom. David, in, uh, in the strategy for doing this takeover, David gives his army very specific instructions. I want you to go, I want you to win, but I want you to deal gently with my son Absalom. <laughs> deal gently with Absalom, whatever that means, right? So those are the instructions that he gave to his, his lieutenants, uh, his leaders of his army, and everybody heard those instructions. And that's really where we pick up in today's story that leads to the ultimate death of Absalom. Uh, not to, not to uh, spoil the ending for you, but that's where we're headed with this. This is the, uh, Absalom's end. So we're in 2 Samuel chapter 18, beginning with verse 6. This is what our passage sounds like. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and it's talking about David's army, went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. Stop here and recognize that this was a battlefield, or so to speak, this was terrain, this was land in the wilderness that David's men would have been very familiar with. They would have had an advantage. This is really a battle on their home field, so to speak, because they spent years there while David was running from Saul and developing his own army. Uh, so they would have definitely had the advantage there. They would have been much smaller than the army of Israel, but the, the terrain would have given them an advantage. Verse 7, And the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the loss there was great on that day, 20,000 men. So 20,000 soldiers in, the, in Israel's army died that day in that battle. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. Again, a reference to that very difficult terrain and, uh, for this battle. So it's sad, I think, that Absalom's, Absalom's rebel army is referred to here as Israel. He was the rebel here. David was the rightful king of Israel. But because of David's poor handling of his own family, he lost that throne for this short period of time when Absalom took it over. Um, this is, make no mistake, a civil war. This is a war among Hebrew soldiers, David's soldiers and Absalom's soldiers. 
And it says here, the, the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. Uh, this is first a comment about God's hand in this battle, that God used the forest to win the day for David, but it, it also shows that God was fighting for David. It's also probably a comment, though, on the superiority of David's military strategies through, um, through us, uh, some back-channel sources and some, uh, uh, some giving military strategy through his friends to Absalom, David actually gained the advantage here and, and outsmarted Absalom. Um, there's a reminder here, all of this, all of this is due to the brokenness between David and his son Absalom, the broken relationship. All of these other people are going to war and fighting this battle all because of David and Absalom's broken relationship. David's very poor behavior, both as a husband and as a father, <clears throat> his infidelity as a husband, his lack of any discipline, any real discipline as a father. But it's also on Absalom, Absalom who murdered his own brother and now has rebelled against his father and against God himself. No reference to God here on Absalom's part. Uh, and it says here in the passage we just read, and the loss there was great on that day, 20 thousand men. So now we have this war involving tens of thousands of other families, all as a result of David's and Absalom's poor handling of their own family, of their own family relationship. This represents an, inter an eternal truth for us that we should remember with regard to leadership. Uh, it's a truth about the, the, the importance of character in leadership. It is David's character flaws, it is Absalom's character flaws that led to all of this. Character matters when it comes to leadership. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first statement on your listening guide. It is an eternal truth. In leadership, character always matters. The higher the level of leadership, the greater the character that is required. Christ followers who make excuses for our leader's character flaws are missing this truth. We need to be careful about that. So then we read about Absalom's own undoing next, beginning in verse 9. And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. And his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. So it seems here, we're not sure exactly what the circumstances are. It's a little odd that, it, that in a war where you would expect to meet the opposing army, it says Absalom encountered or met the men of David. It seems that this happens at a time of retreat for Absalom's men because it doesn't make reference to any other uh, soldiers around Absalom. He seems to be all by himself. And so the presumption here is he's fleeing for his life. He's not worried about who else is with him. He is fleeing for his life is what it seems to be. Um, it doesn't specifically say when he gets caught in this tree that he was caught by his hair. It says he was caught by his head, but it seems that way. It seems that his hair was involved uh, we make that conclusion, though, probably because of how much attention earlier in Scripture uh, Samuel, in writing this story, Samuel gives us uh, with regard to Absalom's hair. Back in, in chapter 14 of 2 Samuel, here's what it says. Now, Absalom was praised as the most handsome man in all Israel. He was flawless from head to foot. He cut his hair only once a year, and then only because it was so heavy when he weighed it out, it came to five pounds. That's how much his hair weighed. So Absalom, the scripture goes out of its way to paint this picture of this long, full, thick, flowing head of hair of Absalom that he apparently was very proud of. Uh, there was some vanity involved here. And so that's one of the reasons we conclude that when he gets his head stuck in the branches of this tree, it probably involved his hair. <laughs> it appears that that the very real symbol of his vanity, that is his hair, his iconic look, ended up being his weakness and perhaps a factor in his demise. Consider these words, 
from two weeks ago in the lesson that we had on David being anointed from 1 Samuel chapter 16, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So there's a lesson here about vanity with regard to Absalom and what ends up bringing him to his end. Consider what Isaiah's prophecy, on the other hand, on the other end of this spectrum, consider what Isaiah's prophecy said about Jesus, the Messiah. In Isaiah 53, the, the hymn of the suffering servant, it says, There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him physically. Uh, that's from Isaiah the prophet looking forward to the Messiah, th th to Jesus. And so uh, th there, there's a contrast here, I believe, between Jesus and between Absalom, uh, Absalom and his vanity. For Absalom, his beautiful appearance, his iconic look, simply could not save him from his own rebellious heart. And that's what's going on here. In a way, this is an entire story illustrating how important character and heart are compared to anything outward, anything in terms of outward appearances. It is a story told in Scripture over and over again, and even Jesus himself commented on this same kind of concept, the same kind of story. In Matthew chapter 23, he says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you are like the whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so, we learn over and over again, both in Absalom's story and from Jesus' own mouth, what's on the inside is what matters most to God. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in this second statement on your listening guide. As a culture, we are so very enamored with appearance and behaviors, perhaps because we can never fully know a person's heart. But God knows, and we are perhaps never more naive than when we place our hopes in outward appearance. That was the story of Absalom. So we have him, we left him still hanging in this tree, but not dead, just hanging and stuck in this tree. Let's see what happens, verse 10. And a certain man, he's unnamed in this passage, a certain man saw it and told Joab. Joab is the commander of David's army. Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. And Joab said to the man who told him, What, you saw him? Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you 10 pieces of silver and a belt. In other words, I would have made you a wealthy man and given you a promotion. But the man said to Joab, Even if I felt in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, I would not reach out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, For my sake protect the young man Absalom. On the other hand, if I had dealt treacherously against his life, and there's nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood aloof. So the man talks quite bravely, speaks power back to power, speaks truth, that is, back to power in Joab. Uh, this unnamed soldier had seen Absalom in his predicament and reports it to Joab. Joab we see in Scripture, and I love the way uh, it was put in the everydayprayer.com uh, devotionals this week. Joab, I think it was Brian Richardson who said this, but Joab was essentially David's fixer, if you will. Joab did so many of the dirty things that in his assessment needed to be done in order to protect David and, and to make sure his throne is intact. Joab is the same person who David asked to put Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, on the front lines to be killed so that he would no longer be in the way for David to have a relationship with Bathsheba. Joab is that person who, over the course of David's reign, has been his fixer, so to speak. Um, uh, he's the one who manipulated circumstances around Absalom to get Absalom returned out of exile and back into Jerusalem, trying to make the relationship with Absalom and David work again and absolve Absalom of his crimes. It didn't work. 
Uh, Joab's loyalty to David seems unquestionable, but in this case, with Absalom, it, that loyalty is going to be tested because Joab knows that what's good for David here is for Absalom to be killed, and this is the perfect opportunity, but he also knows that David doesn't want Absalom killed, and so it puts Joab in a real predicament. From Joab's perspective, though, David did not know what was best for David. Joab needed, in his mind, to save David from David and to do this dirty deed for him. From Joab's perspective, that's what needed to happen. Why then, he says, he says to the man, why did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you ten pieces of silver and a, bowl, and a, and a belt. In other words, a per hefty promotion and made you a wealthy man if you had done this. Um, but the unnamed soldier seemed to know better than Joab how that would probably all play out. Even if I felt in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, I will not reach out my hand against the king's son. He would not go against David's very explicit orders that, that Absalom was to be dealt with gently. And he knew, frankly, that neither Joab nor anyone else would come and stand up for him if he were brought before the king as the person who killed the king's son. Nobody would do that. He knew that. And so he demonstrates, this unnamed soldier, a very high view of obedience to David. Even when it may appear contrary to what the circumstances required, he demonstrated a very high view of obedience. There may be times when God's way or when God's word seems contrary to our understanding of God's overall purposes, seems contrary to our understanding of what the circumstances require right now. And how will we react? How will we conduct ourselves in those circumstances? Similar to Jesus. I'm, I'm reminded of Jesus in the wilderness when he was afforded lots of opportunities to accomplish God's greater good, what, what at least his, his tempter would ref, have referred to as God's greater good. There was a shortcut to be able to do this. You can, you can do, you can have all that you're trying to accomplish here, Jesus, if you'll just bow down to me. And Jesus refused to do it. The, how we get to the end matters to God. Jesus knew that. This unnamed soldier knew that as well. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the, the next statement on your listening guide. Obedience to God is always a right decision, even when it is not clear how that obedience could possibly further God's purposes. When God's directive is clear, our correct next step is likewise clear. But Joab is ever the fixer, and he has no intention of letting this opportunity to end this rebellion slip past him. Look what it says in verse 14. Joab said, I will not waste time like this with you. And he took three javelins in his hand and thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. And then Joab blew the trumpet and the troops came back from pursuing Israel for Joab restrained them. And they took Absalom and threw him in a great pit in the forest and raised over him a very great heap of stones. And all of Israel fled, everyone to his own home. The point of this story seems to be a point about the consequences of disobedience and of rebellion. The ramifications of David's own sin seem to spin out of control and multiply exponentially exactly the way God told him it was going to happen through Samuel. Division and death within his own family, mass casualties for the nation of Israel, and the first hints of division within the nation itself as well. If we would eventually see a divided Israel. It hasn't happened yet, but this is the first hints of a, what a divided Israel might look like. And it says, all Israel fled everyone to his own home. Everyone went home processing what amounted to a civil war within their nation. Processing what does that mean and, and, and what does that mean for us? This, I believe, is a cautionary tale about the rebellion in both Absalom's and David's lives, the rebellion in their lives against God. Jesus spoke to the seriousness of sin when he talked about it in Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, uh, he, he talked about if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off 
and, and it would be better for you to enter to go through the rest of life without a hand than to be thrown into the, the, the fiery gates of hell. Uh, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Jesus talked in these over-the-top, exaggerated ways about the effect of sin in our lives because what he wanted his disciples at that time and us to understand is that that the ripple effects from sin in our life are unseen, but they are huge. They're much deeper and wider than we ever imagined. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the last statement on your listening guide. No matter what we think we understand about the consequences of our spiritually rebellious choices, we almost certainly underestimate them. The ripple effect is most often deeper and wider than we could have imagined. And so, summarizing, what are our takeaways? What are my takeaways here from this passage? Number one, character always matters in leadership. Number two, we show our spiritual immaturity when we place our hopes in outward appearances. Number three, when God's instruction is clear, our next step is likewise clear. And number four, the ripple effect of spiritual rebellion ends up being deeper and wider than we can possibly imagine. Those are my takeaways from this, uh, from this brutal story about Absalom, Absalom's death. I wonder what yours are. I'm loving this study. I hope that you are as well. We're going to pick up right here where we've left off next time. Uh, we're going to be looking at the story of Elijah next time. I'm excited about that story. In the meantime, I hope you guys have an awesome week. I love you guys, and we will see you right here next time.